All right. Thank you for coming. Uh, I didn't know what to expect, who to expect. Um, and so I kept it as, um, as basic or as scientific as possible. Yeah, you turn one off. No, the other one. Was that uh, It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you can see me, right? No, no. <laughs> All right, so um, when I was invited to be a part of the team, I kind of wondered, what am I supposed to talk about? Or what am I supposed to do? And as the time approached, every, as I started thinking about it, the more I thought about it, the more I realized there's a lot involved. And it took me even way back to present time, okay? And so, oops. All right. So I need to change the slide. Okay, there. So as um, Professor Thompson said, this will be a class. And basically, for science, it's, it's, it's a complex kind of um, discipline. It's not just one discipline, a group of disciplines that all come together to give us information. You have to analyze data. You have to be discreet in collecting the data. And more importantly, you have to be capable of sharing that data, that information, the results as, as uh, the best you can. Um, it's, to some degree, it's easy sometimes to collect the data, and it's harder convincing your audience of what you've seen, okay? And so, that said, the more I thought about this talk, the more issues came up, and honestly, I cannot address all these today. Uh, but what you see here, Basically, I'm going to talk about phrenology, uh, the tobacco strategy, climate change, vaccination, autism and vaccination, COVID-19, abortion or breath control, even the LGBTQ issues. And there are others I cannot touch today. I cannot handle, but they are out there for the course, even skin color or race. Uh, I, a bit of that will come in today's talk, but not a whole lot. And then genes and environment, evolution, gender, even secondary metabolites in plants. So to start with, I want us to establish uh, the difference between a myth and a misconception, because these two kind of influence science to some degree. And Britannica defines a myth as a symbolic narrative, uh, usually of unknown origin, and at least partly traditional, that relates to actual events, and is especially associated with religious belief of some sort. Um, Miriam Webster defines it in a similar way, and it says it's a popular belief or tradition that has grown up around something or someone and especially embodies ideals and institutions of a society. Then misconception is first, this, uh, in, my, in Britannica, it defines it as a wrong or mistaken idea, okay? And Miriam Webster defines that as a wrong or inaccurate idea. Either way, you can see that it's about an idea and it's wrong, okay? But it may be accepted. So I want to start by touching on um, centuries ago, in the 18th centuries to the 19th century, when the science, uh, the pseudoscience phrenology came up. Basically, this was uh, pioneered by a German neuroanatomist and physiologist by name Franz Joseph Gall. And what he did was he was a, basically he was a, a scientist. So he studied the shape and sizes of human brains 
as indicative of character and mental abilities. Okay? And that was in Europe, somewhere around 1796. That's way back there. And in, in his reporting, he said, bombs on the head actually correspond to personalities and abilities. And at the time, it kind of was, um, it was believed. People believed that because he did have some form of data to show. And that's he, he, he said there are different regions of the brain and they correspond to different mental abilities. And it's kind of something like this, where every region he was able to identify, to play a role in the person's overall behavior and, and well-being. He looked at 27 personality factors and that was a, a shoddy study. It wasn't credible, but at the time, even though it lacked that scientific rigor, it, 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 you know, it got accepted. And he ignored any other evidence that contradicted that. And to this day, uh, though it's gone away, though we, don't, we now know the, the, uh, the facts, the myth still lingers on to some degree. And so back then, there were all kinds of uh, measurements on people's heads, um, hospitals, you know, people who are uh, mentally ill or criminals. Heads will be analyzed, measured and analyzed um, to the point that it created uh, confusion. Basically, if you want um, a husband, if you want, a, want, a, want a, a good marriage, you can use that to determine who, who will be a better man for you. And is that science or is that BS? But well, that was the error. So you can imagine uh, if, if you were born with that kind of head. It even extended into racial um, uh, differentiations, okay? And so it went on and on. And unfortunately, it wasn't a short, for just a short time. It actually um, made a lot of difference back then. But it was all uh, false science. It was weird. It actually um, was distinguishing between nature and nurture, and it created debates. And unfortunately, it justified colonialism back then. It justified slavery, even criminalization of people with mental problems, OK? And, and yet, um, how true was that? Okay. And with all that, it was about this um, phrenology resulted in the stratification of humans, um, the human species, where some are superior, others are inferior, and it, it had endless limits. <coughs> but what it also did to every bad thing, there can be a good thing. It, it, it stimulated uh, scientists to, to jump in and research, to test, or to, to uh, reevaluate his finding. And particularly, it led to neurological studies. And um, one guy, he's, he was a French, Pierre Paul Broca. He, through his studies, was able to realize that, yeah, one of the uh, fac uh, faculties actually um, was, is responsible for, for language. He, he studied stroke patients and he realized that, yeah, when, people get some, when some people get stroke, it affects their language. And he was able to um, identify that on the brain as to where that happens. And so, as, as bad as uh, phenology, or the, uh, as, 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 as influential as phenology was, it also um, prompted more studies. And particularly, um, over the years, it led to the use of MRIs and, uh, and, and PET scans to study the brain in detail. All the way to um, 2018, so this is in recent uh, centuries, in this 20th, 21st century, where in the UK, a group of scientists decided to study 23 of the 27 
um, personality factors that God had, had, had said he knew what they did. And they analyzed 6,000 brain scans. Okay, so uh, it was a big, a big study. And through the analysis, they, came, they realized that um, basically there's no correlation between the contours of the skull, okay, and any of these 23 factors that um, God had, had, uh, had been preaching all along. There's no correlation between the contours of the skull and the curvature of the brain. So just because somebody has a certain shape of head doesn't mean that the brain is also shaped the same, okay? It's different. And that the skull, therefore, did not mirror the brain surface. They are two different things. And as a result of this study, um, his uh, findings, God's findings was debunked. And today, after like two centuries, gradually it's fading away, but not completely. So fast forward, now we, are in the, uh, now we get to the 20th century, and there was the tobacco um, era as well, okay? Whereby in the mid-1950s, the tobacco industry was making a lot of money. However, it was clear that it was a harmful product, and yet um, they did, there were all kinds of um, studies supporting uh, the, the, the good things about that product. And it didn't only stay with smoking tobacco, but it also scientific, all kinds of scientific findings uh, came up on things like acid rain, DDT, even um, the ozone hole, the hole in the ozone layer and all that. And unfortunately, these were perpetrated by high-powered scientists. And why was that so? They had connections with industry. They had connections with political, um, uh, we, we know, with, with, with some politicians. And so they kept that controversy alive, and the doubt was spread out. And in the process, uh, that product stayed, that industry thrived. Okay. Um, later on, in recent times, the two uh, writers, investigators, basically uh, Naomi Oreskes and uh, Eric Conway, they wrote this book about the merchants of doubt and talked about how a handful of scientists were able to obscure this information of the tobacco all the way to even global warming today, okay? And so um, for over four decades, there was a denial of science. The tobacco industry um, did well. However, from this book, from what they found um, and they shared with others, so I, I kind of go back, I wish I could go back. Okay, there we go, yeah. And so they wrote on the strategy that these um, scientists used to, to basically oppose the, the truth. And today we all know, in fact, with or without that fi th these findings, we all know what tobacco does to a person in the long run, if you are not lucky, okay? All right. And so the effect of smoking is, 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 is a lot. It's not just one kind of illness. It's all, um, it can affect your lungs, it can affect your, even your, your, your mouth, it can affect your, um, it can give you cancers of different forms. Despite the efforts to, to offer the public different, different versions of it, a lot of choices to choose from, okay? And so the harmful effects of smoking cigarettes came to confirm what um, Naomi and Eric had, had, had published among what other scientists had, um, had, had been reported, that it wasn't a bad product. 
Uh, moving forward today, yes, we are kind of overcoming um, smoking cigarettes, but there's now a new product, kind of like a substitute. We get them, we've been uh, told it is better, vaping. But even that, we are, we are lucky that in, in the relatively, say, two decades that this product has been there, we're beginning to realize the adverse effects. But we don't know. We don't know it all. And scientific studies have not been conducted. So in the meantime, it is what the industry tells us that we accept or we take. That's all we have. And you have to figure it out or else um, you, you know eventually. All right, and then there's also the issue of climate change. What is climate change? United Nations um, refers to it as the long-term shifts in temperature and weather patterns. And these shifts may be natural, though through uh, variations in the solar cycle. NASA also defines climate change as a change in the usual weather found in a place, and this could be a change in how much rain a place usually gets in a year, or it could be a change in the place's usual temperature for a month or a season. And that this climate change is also a change in the Earth's climate. So it, uh, this could change the Earth's temperature in the long term, and, um, or it could change in places where, you know, it could impact how much rainfall or snow we get. But let us not confuse climate, with, climate change with weather, or climate with weather. Sometimes people don't really know that. The weather is something that can change in just a few hours. And here in Oklahoma, I think I don't need to preach to the choir. We know how our weather can swing from one end 30-something, uh, and next time it's 60-something, right? Yes. Uh, but climate takes a long time. And so you may not even see it in your lifetime, but if you are lucky, or I would, I would say lucky, but I would say you could see that. Now, there are all kinds of myths about climate change, too, because now that is one of the uh, controversial issues we have to deal with. Um, climate change is considered, oh, it's a future problem. Like I said, you may not even see it in your lifetime. At least that's what we would expect, okay? But what we see, even here in North America, is that we tend to get prolonged droughts. If you go to a place like California, uh, Northern California, for instance, uh, even Texas, right over here, um, they get prolonged droughts, um, however, in some places, too, we get a lot of floods, okay? Um, wetlands and reservoirs in these Texas and, and, and California, for example, are drying out at alarming rates. Um, the growing season is shrinking in some places. Basically, uh, a lot of crops rely on insects like bees and wasps to, to pollinate them. But if, let's say, spring comes early, even early could be a matter of days or weeks, and, and the bees are not ready in their life cycle, or they, are not, they haven't moved to that area, by the time the bees get there, the plant would have already flowered without the fertilization event occurring. Okay? So there are some things that we don't easily see but are going on out there. Some people even say, well, the polar bears numbers are increasing. Maybe in a place where they try to conserve them, they are increasing. And so this person is, is, just knows this area, and so that's fine. But we're looking at it at a global level. Some people feel animals will adapt, because this is not the only time we've had um, a change in climate. Um, others also feel that with all the... Uh, the push for us to move to renewable energy is just a money-making scheme. Uh, there's nothing um, to worry about climate change. And others also wonder that, well, if we want to go into wind and solar, then it means that when it's uh, nighttime and there's no sun, it means we, could, we, we wouldn't get energy. Maybe, but there's ways of storing that. 
Same with wind. And others also feel that uh, maybe it's China. Some countries are responsible, others are not. Okay. However, we know that climate change is just part of a natural cycle. That's what some people think. Yes, it is. So should we just downplay it? No. Basically, since the Industrial Revolution, in the last 150 or more years, there have been changes that do not seem natural, uh, but more exceptional. Um, there have been ice ages, um, little ice age, there's been periods of warming in our history, but all these were regional, okay? Uh, of course, back then people were not traveling about much to know what is going on in, say, the tropics. And so if you are restricted, if you typically move around, say, Europe, that's what you see. But um, it's, that was not global. And um, others have also thought changes may be due to sunspots. Some even feel that you know, when we get winters, some feel, oh, it's, it, it's, it's cold. We still get cold weather. So what is the warming about? What do you mean by warming when, when we get cold? But we also know that um, other times of the year, we do experience heat waves. Okay, we experience droughts. We experience severe um, weather extremes. And this image I have here, these images I have show, uh, the, uh, the two up here show Lake Oroville in Northern California. Northern California is an agricultural area. And so they, uh, you know, water is a big deal over there. And Lake Oroville is drying out big time. So there's a lot of uh, conflicts about who to use it and, and how much and so forth. And as at last year, October, this is what um, Lake Oroville looked like. In the meantime, go elsewhere, there were floods. So, and we all know, sometimes we hear of floods on the east, then on the west there's wildfire, and you kind of wonder, how, how can't we transport the water across? You know, if we could do that, that, that would solve the problem, but it's not that easy. Here is the Hoover Dam. I, I kind of like that spot. Uh, it was built barely 70 years ago, so it's not a century yet. And originally, that was the level of the, uh, that was the, level of the water, okay? Of course, it's in Nevada, Arizona border. It's a dry place, but they are heavily using uh, that, that, that reservoir for um, hydroelectric power. Las Vegas depends on that. Los Angeles, two major cities are all depending on that. And this is where the water level is today. Uh, the question is, how are we going to get it back? When you look at temperature, some people don't believe that. Well, I, I remember many years ago when I first started here at Rose State, uh, I had a student, uh, he was probably close to 90 years. He, you know, he just wanted to come to school and while away time. And he told me, he said, we have, all through my lifetime, we have had all these you know, warming and, and, and cooling cycles uh, because you know, he's lived to be old and, and he thought it's no big deal. Maybe that's what you see, but what, is the, what, is, what are the facts about that? Okay, uh, if you look at this graph here, basically, uh, yes, there was a gradual increase, but somewhere from the 1950s going up, and particularly in the last 20, 30 years, we have had the warmest. The rate has increased far beyond, what, uh, far beyond the rate at which it was going. And we are also seeing that, so here greenhouse gases have increased because of the, of the human activity. We are basically releasing a lot of gases like carbon dioxide, methane. These all have the potential to hold um, uh, heat, so basically to trap heat, okay? And so what happens is that the atmosphere is warming up more than it should, and that is causing more evaporation from the surface. 
from the land, from our water, from, uh, from the uh, surface water, from the oceans. You're getting a lot of moisture, a lot of evaporation, and these are holding up, and eventually when they come down, then they come down as severe storms, whether it's in the winter or not. But there has been an increase, and scientists have the data. They have been measuring that. In fact, somewhere between uh, 93 to, say, 2000, um, it was uh, measured that the, uh, the temperature, this is global, no, sea level, this is for sea level, sea level is rising slowly with that increase because the seas basically are, are, are holding, uh, because of the evaporation, uh, we are having um, glaciers melting and all that, and so the level of the sea is rising slowly. It's not clear, it's not easy to see, but if you are measuring, you notice that. And that between the 90s to the millennium, the start of the century, it was like at about 2.1 millimeters per year. However, in the last, like 2013 to now, it has doubled. So the sea level is rising um, faster than even before when it was already rising up. And it's impacting a lot of um, there's a lot of the habitats of wildlife. Um, our polar bears, for instance, are being limited to smaller spaces of ice than they typically um, were used to. And so they have to adapt, but at this current rate, at that rate, how, how likely can they catch up in their, in their lifetime? We've also seen hurricanes and, and, and um, storms here. This is um, Hurricane Sandy, that is New Jersey, along the shores of New Jersey um, back then. Um, with that increase in sea level and with all that uh, rain coming, it literally inundated the shores. Of course, now when you go back, they have rebuilt, but is that what we would want to do consistently? Uh, be building, you know, we get distraction and we build, we get distraction and build. would that be necessary? How else can we uh, mitigate this problem? And so um, the scientific evidence is there. Climate change is, is literally um, at loggerheads with, um, with the myth, okay? So scientists, the, the facts are there, the myths are there. There are those who are also benefiting from the activities, and so they don't want to check on that. They don't want to slow down on that. But we also have diseases. It's not just climate change, but diseases as well. And over the years, as diseases come up, if they are uh, devastated, if they affect public health, there's always the effort to, uh, to curb them, at least to find a solution. And as we all know, the, the, the childhood killer diseases like measles, mumps, and rubella, among others, have been controlled with vaccination. Okay? But there are also some that, there are some of these diseases that um, you just don't take the vaccine once, but you may have to take it um, from time to time. And the flu is an example of that. We did um, experience Ebola. Ebola came and Ebola is still there, but Ebola was contained, at least it didn't spread. We have, now we talk about coronavirus as though it's a new virus that has just shown up. No, coronaviruses have been there for quite some time. Um, at one time, we had the SARS, um, which is a coronavirus. We've had the MERS, which is also a coronavirus, and now we have the COVID-19 virus. It's because viruses are particles, they are not cells. However, they carry genetic material, and so when they get a host, they can be re uh, replicated, they can be recreated. And so when there's a host cell, they, they do replicate, and that gives them the opportunity to mutate. The mutations are errors, in, during the replication process, and if the errors don't kill, uh, don't get rid of the, uh, or overcome the virus, but makes it survive, then sometimes it may either be uh, 
turn out to be a, a worse form of the virus, or if you are lucky, a mild form of the virus. Okay? And so, um, somewhere in the, in the mid-90s, so now we are in the 20th century, quite recent, there were concerns about the vaccines, specifically the MMR, the vaccine for the uh, measles, uh, mumps, and rubella. And a group of British scientists led by Andrew Wakefield uh, basically brought findings of their research speculating that um, the vaccine MMR, the vaccine for MMR causes intestinal tissue disruptions and, and worse of all, uh, autism. And that caused a lot of panic, okay? How did they arrive at this? Think of all the children you may find in, say, London, or even in Europe overall. They sampled 12 kids, 12 babies. And out of the 12, claimed they found eight that were autistic due to the uh, vaccination of that combined, uh, you know, the, due to the vaccination of that combined uh, vaccines. He therefore, he and his, he in particular therefore proposed that instead of combining those three vaccines and administering it once, they should probably separate them out, give them out um, as single shots over time. This was covered widely by the press and the press plays a major role in all these. However, apparently, he, because he is proposing he was then proposing single antigen um, vaccines. He had actually invented one and was waiting for patency. So he had his own agenda for, <laughs> for uh, debunking the, the, the combined vaccine. Okay. Um, and then it also appeared that parents who had autistic children and had been vaccinated had found lawyers who wanted to sue the companies. Okay, so uh, this guy, Wakefield, had been paid by attorneys to, uh, to, to, to propagate his findings, his false findings, so that they can profit off it. And, and yet, a lot of research, so this caused a lot of research to go on, to find the truth, and all the research scientists were coming out with, um, with findings that did not prove um, Wakefield's findings. Basically, where they were rejecting it. And at some point, the, the journal Lancet, the one that initially published his paper, an editor, a recent editor, decided to do his own investigation. So basically, he went to those uh, 12 uh, subjects or cases that were used for the studies and investigated, and apparently found that of the 12, two were already autistic when they were included in the study, okay? And only two developed autistic during the study. So basically, so that, that may, either it's accidental or it was happening, but it was not eight out of 12. And to think of the fact that you do a study of only 12 people by itself, is inadequate, okay? You, uh, the, if you want to sell an idea out or a findings to the whole world, then you better, you should have expanded your, your sample size. But 12 already was too low. And so it was fatally, it was, re, it was realized that Wakefield's findings was fatally flawed. It just wasn't true. Um, so why do we have to take vaccines? So we know that vaccines reduce spread, of uh, diseases, they prevent complications, they can even prevent death. But we also have to realize that not every vaccine, uh, vaccines are not 100% effective. There's always bound to be some who will not be favorably uh, impacted by the vaccine if they take it. But um, the efficacy differs from vaccine to vaccine, from disease to disease. Sometimes, even within the population, the demography, uh, if you take something like the flu, uh, the flu vaccine, 
Um, it works better in younger people than older people. Okay, so there are all kinds of uh, outcomes. But overall, if you consider the outcome, um, if it's about 50%, um, it's something. Okay. What we know, though, is that, yes, there can be risk, just as there are benefits. To every situation, that to every action, there's a, there's a reaction. Oh. And so uh, the obvious risk with vaccination is, is at least soreness at the site. In some cases, it can, um, it can lead to allergic reactions. In the severe cases, in a few people, you could get like uh, seizures and, and more severe um, outcomes. But overall, um, they are better. And so the myths and facts about vaccines is that some will say they are no longer needed because, yeah, some people could do without it. But, and, and, and so let's keep clean environment, let's be hygienic and all that. Yes, but we also know that despite all our efforts in, with, with uh, our environment and our surroundings, uh, some of these diseases reappear over time. Okay? And so if we want to uh, rely on, um, on basically herd immunity, if some are going to take and some are not, it doesn't mean that we can easily accomplish. We need to do more than that. Some also say that the vaccines are not safe. Um, maybe so, but maybe not, okay? Because vaccines are rigorously tested. Um, in science, when, you, uh, when scientists are working in the lab, more often than not, you may not be aware of what they're doing until they find something and bring forward. But there's a lot of tests that goes on behind the scenes. Um, eventually, when, it's, uh, when there is the, the, the findings have been tested, that's when they, they, they release their findings. And even while the vaccine is being administered, they keep monitoring, and, and, and it just doesn't end there. Um, some, also, some myths also say that uh, getting infections build immunity better than the vaccine. Um, that is the disease you are getting. If you are, if you are able to make it, good. But what if you die? Okay, and we know that that happens. Um, and then some may also say that, well, vaccines are not needed if the disease doesn't exist in the country. Maybe, but considering how we travel back and forth, you may not know what a traveler is bringing in. Okay, so you have to be prepared for that. And, and, and talk of that, um, there are anti-vaxxers, I, so I found this on the, on, on the internet, especially with measles. Measles was kind of controlled, but in the year 2013, um, in Texas, there was an increase of about 12% um, denial from parents. They didn't want to, um, to vaccinate their kids for various reasons, and it was because of this... Uh, um, the, 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 the past findings that had, had already, was already the, the lingering effects of, of uh, Wakefield's study. But uh, measles had been eradicated fairly well by 2000, but it did resurface. And a lot of children, about 700,000 were reported, uh, a lot of uh, 700,000 deaths were reported in just the last 20 years. Okay, and so, um, if we don't um, keep our guard, the diseases can come back. And, and since these viruses and bacteria mutate, there's no, you, you cannot be sure that there's an end. Unfortunately, uh, these anti vaccines create panic that is lingering. Um, is it science? Is it, um, or what? Okay, well, what is it? Um, some are promoting that the vaccination itself is medical malpractice. Um, many are good speakers. They are able to conduct shows, you know, kind of able to convince people. And they draw attention from a lot of people, even intellectuals and educated people um, get, get um, you know, 
get convinced about that. And from what I have here, we see that measles are coming back. It was eradicated 2000, the year 2000, 20 years later, it is resurfacing. So that's something that needs to be um, addressed. Um, if you look at about 31 states in the country have confirmed measles in, in, um, since 2000, when it was thought to have been eradicated. And um, it is impacting lives. In the, in the reddish regions, those are where we have high levels. And as you can see, um, originally the number of lives that were saved by measles um, was high, but after the vaccinations, um, now that, you know, in recent times, it looks like not so much. Things are changing, basically. And so um, we see all kinds, now we are in an, another era of a disease, and some are going for the vaccine, others are not. There's a lot of, you know, protests uh, because of Wakefield's um, and, and what ensued from there. What, what are we going to do about it and how are we going to approach it? Okay, are we going to consider the science or are we going to consider what, um, what sounds better? Okay, it's not about what, so what, what, the sound, what, what it sounds like, it's more about the facts. Okay, and as I pointed out, viruses change. Uh, coronavirus especially mutates. And they have, there are about seven known coronaviruses um, when it was first identified in 1965. And the SARS, the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, and the MERS, uh, all these did not spread too far out from where this, the, the, uh, they broke out. But the COVID-19 is the one that basically has, uh, has overtaken us as a population. And so now the science, scientists are faced with convincing the population about their findings or the facts. How do you report that? How do you report the facts? Okay, that's a very tricky one. Um, and are you going to report in numbers? Are you going to report in percentages? Are you going to report in p-value, probability value, graphs, imagery? a blend of these facts, that is where the trick is. Because uh, depending on how you present the data, you may um, have a different message. From that same message, you can present it and end up in a different way. And that's why we have in this talk um, dazzle or baffle, OK? Dazzle with science or baffle with BS. So let's take a look at something. Let's look at 9-11. And, if, and we all know the impact 9-11 had on this country. First, the impact it had in New, New, York, New York and the East overall, New York, uh, New York State, this country, and even the world. Uh, once upon a time, if you were taking someone to the airport, you could go all the way to the gate with that person. Now, you have to go through security. In fact, you can go past security. Only the traveler goes, OK? And that's because of what happened. Terrorists attacked us. The death toll was 2,977. That's how many people died. And what did we do as a result of that? We went after them. Our lifestyle changed. And then there were even two wars following that number. OK? So let's do a reality check now in some current, uh, and I'm going to use the coronavirus because that's the new kind of issue we have now. In that, if you are going to, all along with 9-11, the report was on the number. What if the report had been in percentages? Okay, the, the percentage of New York City residents who got affected, it would have been 0 0.0347. That is like insignificant. But that's because it's a percentage, OK? If you take the actual number 2,900 and over, that is significant. So if, if we didn't want to care about that, we would have 
uh, reported in percentage. But no, that would not have made the impact. It would not have generated the response that we, we got. Okay? So let's look at the global COVID-19 deaths today. There are five, five, over 5 million, almost 6 million people. Back. That's the time I got this data. If you consider the world population of 7.3 billion, that is 0.075%. Somebody will say, that is nothing. Well, look at the number. Five million people, almost six million, have died. Not only have they lost their lives, think of the families that have been impacted. The children who are now orphans. I hear that's a new problem now. There's a lot of orphans that are, are out there who need to, need to be careful. So you cannot look at percentage and, and then decide to take, um, uh, take action on that. You have to look at the number itself. When it comes to uh, tragedies, percentages don't work. It's the actual numbers that work. Okay? Uh, same with the cases. Um, and if we come down to the US, our death is over 900,000. That's a lot of people. But you put that in percentage, and it seems like it's nothing. We don't have to look at the percentage. Because if that's what we're going to look at, then we don't have a problem. But the number is uh, corresponds to individual people, individual lives that are impacted. Okay, and the same with the cases. And so let's come down to our state. Um, our state, we have over 12,000 people who have died as a result of that. Um, that percentage, 0.323, is even higher than the whole nation's percentage, even globally. But you look at the number itself, and it's, oh, 12,900, okay? Um, you think, oh, it's no big deal. Um, that's a big deal here. That's a, a lot that we need to pay attention to. And so, do we dazzle or baffle? We want to face the science, face the reality. And it's not how you present it. Unfortunately, the presentation sometimes wins over the fact. There are a lot of issues, and I want to touch on, say, the um, reproduction, OK? I'm a botanist, so I like to use that as an example. If you take a plant, OK, a plant we are what we call, uh, both plants and animals and us, we are diploid. We inherit half of our uh, chromosomes from mom, half of our chromosomes from dad. You put them together, it makes diploid, OK? And so over here. I think I'll just use my mouse here. Um, the, this is a flower. That's the reproductive organ of the plant. And in here, it has the male organ and the female organ. The male makes the pollen. The female makes the egg. That's what stays inside. Eventually, that's what becomes a seed. And this, the pollen, at least in flowering plants, and yeah, flowering plants and even non-flowering plants, the pollen can be separated from the plant and out there, but it still remains viable. The, the egg, on the other hand, for the female, that is so precious that stays uh, in the flower, okay? Until as a pollen fertilizes the egg and then it will germinate. Now, come, so in, in, in botany, plant biology, we refer to that as alternation of generations. Because when you have the plant, it occurs in two, the individual, let's say me, I occur in two forms. There's me that you see here, I'm the diploid, I'm the um, dominant generation, which is diploid, but I have ovaries, and my same me, but with half of the chromosomes exist in my ovaries as egg cells, okay? And so uh, that's an individual, so to speak, except it's not independent. It has to depend on the parents. And, and so humans, we do have that as well. We don't call ours alternation of generations because we don't see the egg and we don't see the sperm. They are both precious, so they stay internally. But the process is the same. Where at some point, the sperm will have to swim and find the egg to fertilize to make a zygote. 
And then that zygote, which then becomes the embryo, ultimately becomes the person. Um, in recent times, there are a lot, there's a lot of, um, th there's a lot of uh, conflict or, or debates, controversy about pro-life and about abortion. And it doesn't matter which side you are on. I don't take sides. But I look at it scientifically. And it's like, um, what exactly do we want? We want to save lives because we are pro-life, or we don't want to get rid of life because we don't want abortion, OK? Uh, either way, what makes us choose the fetus as what should not be thrown away, and not the egg or the sperm? There are people who do in vitro fertilization. Um, is that something that should be allowed? Have we thought about that? Because not everybody can afford that. That is to create life. And, and so is that something that we need to pay attention to or what? And even in that, in, that, um, in vitro fertilization, not all the eggs and sperms that will be um, experimented on will actually be created into a child. So what happens to those? Because those are individuals, OK? Uh, and who decides on when? I know we, people say, well, once the heartbeat starts, why is the heartbeat important? Why not the genes? Why not the zygote? Why not the gametes, the egg or the sperm? Um, if we really want to preserve life, then we have to make the conscious effort to look at all the stages. Because at any point in time, everybody has the potential to produce as many offsprings as possible because we have the capability, it is there, okay? We don't have to say, I don't see how we have to wait till it gets here, then it's a problem. What about here? It's like I have money and I go buy something and now I'm being told once I purchase the commodity, it's precious, so don't throw away, but I can throw money away. No, or I have raw ingredients, I can throw away once I, I cook, you cannot, okay? It's all relative. And for that matter, we need to at least be tolerant of each other's views and at least um, know that it may be a myth or it may be a fact. We don't have the, all, the, all the, uh, the facts yet. But until that, we have to be um, at least tolerant of each other. Another issue at stake is uh, gays and lesbians, where uh, culturally and religiously, we believe it's not the norm. It shouldn't happen. Do we know why these people do that? Do we know whether there's a scientific uh, or a genetic predisposition? We don't know. If you take phrenology, it took um, like 200 years for us to finally realize it was false science. A lot of things, when it comes to science, when you are ready for the uh, evidence, it may not be there. It takes time, and you may be impatient waiting for that. But in the meantime, you need to allow everyone the space because uh, we don't know. We shouldn't be judgmental, okay? And so um, a lot of things have happened in the past that fast forward we realize, oh, that was wrong, but people were affected. People were harmed because of the belief and because of the ignorance, okay, ignorance. Just because you don't know, we think what you know is good enough, but it can be dangerous to who you, you do that to, okay? And so if we, we, it's not good to be close-minded. Uh, that doesn't help society as a whole. If an anomaly appears within our society, we need to, be, we need to approach it with caution. We need to uh, be careful in our judgment. And so we have to be open-minded. We need to allow for robust um, research to go on in this, OK? Uh, the name research means you have searched and you, you search again. And the again can be again and again and again. It may not end. And so we have to allow that to happen. We have to reevaluate data, like the editor of the Lancet Journal 
when he went back and re-evaluated Wakefield's study, he realized that there was a lot of falsification that uh, happened. Okay, so if somebody has seen something and you don't, or reported something and you don't want it or you don't like it, you have to reevaluate it and do it in a rigorous way and, and be clear and be, and be fair. We also have to think of peer review. Usually in science, before a paper is published, it will go through a review process. And honestly, if you cannot convince your, your, your reviewers, your work will never get published. Yeah, you'll be going from one, one journal to the next. I'm in a situation like that. And it's not that you don't have the facts, but it's not convincing enough. And so to be convincing, you have to be clear. Okay? And so time is very critical in science and in, in our society when tough issues arise. Uh, we have to be patient. Uh, we probably, it may not probably be in our lifetime. We may die and go. It doesn't matter. If the answers have not been found, that is what the situation is now. And so we we'll have to keep it like that. We have to be tolerant. We have to accommodate each other. And we have to be open-minded. Okay? And so um, there is a difference in the direction of ignorance and the direction of knowledge. And um, where ignorance is our master, there is no possibility of real peace. We want to achieve that. There are several misconceptions out there in every sphere of science. Um, I will just scroll here. But I want to go to uh, YouTube. I'm going to pull this video out and share something that, you know, this happened in the 19th century uh, with Bertha Benz. Uh, she was the wife of Carl Benz, and uh, they are Germans and business partners. And um, I'm going to shift to that in a second and come back. For those of you out there, let's do that real quick. And it is to uh, basically point out what, let's see if I can get. Oh, one second. Oh, <laughs> now I'm confused here. Okay. Okay, I'm going to go back and start here. Just a second.
And so that was how Mercedes-Benz came to be. And um, basically, something that was mocked at when Bertha got to the town apparently was the engine of our transportation. Okay, so when you don't know something, it doesn't necessarily mean that it shouldn't be, um, you shouldn't give it time. We need to be tolerant. That's my message um, today. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>